Good evening, everyone. Praise the Lord. I trust you're all having a good week uh, in the Lord, and that, uh, that, and again, that doesn't necessarily mean everything is going well, but I trust you're having a good week in the Lord, right? So, Dan, amen? <laughs> so, things going well in the Lord is absolutely key, that we stay focused on the things of God always, our faith founded in Him. Let's just ask for the Lord's blessing upon our time together, upon this lesson plan, and that, you know, that all of us, that the Holy Spirit would teach all of us. Amen? That's teach us, Lord. And matter of fact, as we're praying, would you ask the Lord to make that your prayer? Would you ask Him, Lord, teach me. Holy Spirit, teach me. Uh, Father in heaven, we're gathered together, and the most important thing, Lord, is we're gathered in your name. That is the key. If we're just gathering but it's in anyone else's name, our name or some society or some social aspect. Or, but Lord, we're want to, we want to be gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. And so Lord, we're gathering together, seeking your face, looking to understand who you are in our lives and to understand who we are in your life. That we would have the mind of Christ. Father, that your spirit would be here, so powerful, Lord, in such a way that we would receive the word of God and hold it in rich value. Lord, that we would look at the scriptures and that they would open up to us, illuminating minds, igniting hearts, causing passion to erupt. Lord, that living waters would come forth and that each and every person would simply want to obey the Lord, to trust and obey, because there's no other way. Father, that your love would be just saturating us right now. Anyone dealing with any sort of burden, uh, any sort of uh, difficulty, just a, a weight that is upon them. Lord, I pray right now that they would receive your comfort, your strength, and your deliverance, and that they would just give it to you and trust you for all. Lord, keep helping people to break through their fears, their inhibitions, where they feel intimidated, where they're scared to go, Give them that faith to hear the word of the Lord and to step forward through that threshold and receive all that you have for them. Let your love continue to bathe us, to soften us, and to make us sensitive to your presence. Lord, as we have said and will keep saying, we don't want to be just another church. We want to be a beacon of light for those who need hope, faith, truth, and are looking for life that is in you. Bless this body, bless this church, and bless their families in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, it's amazing to think that here we are again for the Holy Spirit class. So important to learn of who He is. Why? Because that's who's in you. <laughs> so I would think that every person would want to know the Holy Spirit. So to know who He is in us. So... We've been dealing with uh, uh, introducing the spirit world and understanding uh, the spirit world in general. That was the introduction. We've gone through the, the person, the presence, and the power. We've dealt with the character, the conduct, and we're in the concerns. And Lord willing and Lord empowering, and by the grace of God, this will be the last one on the concerns of the Holy Spirit. Now, the concerns of the Holy Spirit, as mentioned and need to be stressed, again, is what captures his attention. What does he place his attention on? What is he focused on? That's what we mean by concerns, not concerned in the sense of fret or worry or hope it works out, but concerns in the sense of it's captivating his attention. That's what concerns are to you, what captures your attention. However, our concerns usually lead to fret and are handled by fret. Fret and fear are usually the way that we handle the unknown or handle things, that's the natural man, handling things that are uh, bothering us or that need attention. But the Holy Spirit isn't handling things with fret and anxiety and fear. Uh, but what is he focused his attention on? We've gone through a variety of them. As you remember, the inner man, the mature man, the complete man, uh, bringing us to a state of maturity in him, making us perfect in him. And then last week or last month, we went into the kingdom of God. Remember? The kingdom of God. Absolutely key. Remember what we said, that it started from the very beginning, it's been about the kingdom of God, and to the very end, it will be about the kingdom of God. 
God is establishing his kingdom. And as we said in Romans, I think you got this, but in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, the kingdom of God is one of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Matter of fact, let's just look there real quick so that we have a foundation to launch from. Romans chapter 14, verse 17 Powerful, powerful book, by the way, as you most likely know, Romans chapter 14, verse 17. If you want to know what this kingdom looks like in you, this is what he's after. And this will, this kind of culminates everything we talked about in regards to his character and his conduct. Deals with, for the kingdom of God is not food and drink. Remember all those outward external religious practices of food and drink. What will we eat? Don't eat this. It's nothing to do with any of that. He says, but it's righteousness, which is right thinking and right behavior found in him. Peace, Jesus, the peace of God, the peace I give you, not as the world gives you. And joy, remember, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Where is it found? In the Holy Spirit. If you want those three, you must have the Holy Spirit, right? If you do not have the Holy Spirit, what are you missing? Those three. If you have the Holy Spirit, what is he trying to bring more of out of our lives? Those three things. It's, it, if, you're, if you're wondering, if you're, if you're going to try to memorize any scripture, this is a good one to get. That Because it will anchor you as to what is God doing in my life? I can assure you, he's working on righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Spirit. Bringing those forth, cutting away that which is disturbing it, and ushering in that which will bring it forth. Not that all circumstances go well, but that in the midst of the storm, you have what? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Where? In the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Spirit. Absolutely key. I would think that every person in this room has at some point experienced, if even not now, something that has disturbed your peace. Amen, brother. And when something disturbs your peace, right, when something disturbs your peace, when that peace, the peace of God is not present, it can make for a long night. It can make for a long day. It can make for a hard life. But when all of a sudden that which has been disturbing it is flooded away, washed clean, it's amazing how sweet that peace is. Amen. Same thing with the joy. And if you want the joy, the joy is in the Holy Spirit. And where does Jesus say to begin? Joy that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. If you're going to begin anywhere, begin there. That's the foundation. And then righteousness, that's the tough one. Old man goes, new man coming forward. First as a babe, then as a child, then growing and maturing and becoming, what? Complete, mature, perfect man in him. How do we do that? All scripture is given by inspiration of God that a man of God may be complete, perfect, knowing the will of God. That's what 2 Timothy says. So in looking at what the scriptures are all about, that's why we study, that's why we learn, and hopefully that's why you're here tonight. That's why I'm here tonight, that we would learn of him. So we're still dealing with the kingdom of God. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. John chapter 18, verse 36, if you're taking notes, and hopefully you are, John chapter 18, verse 36 says, my kingdom is not of this world. What's he say? He's, he's got a kingdom. It's not of this world. So let's say it another way. Anything to do with this world is not him. Is not of him, not for him. Not by him, this whole world and everything. So, well, what do you mean? All's a big word. Exactly. Cover all the political aspects, all the social aspects, all the financial aspects, all the religious aspects. Cover it all. Go through any litany of lists that you want. Go through it and exhaust any list you want, and you'll find that he says nothing has to do with him. So, in this, we must recognize that he's the one who said, My kingdom is not of this world. He does say, and the scriptures reinforce, that there is, this world is under the sway of another. 
that he even calls the God of this age under its sway. We must recognize that as well. We, therefore, in this great kingdom plan, he is calling out ecclesia, the church. Out of this great sway of the evil one and wickedness and evil and deception and lies and all the things he says that this world is not of me. My kingdom is not of this world. doesn't come from it. It's not it, out, anything to do with him. He's saying out of this, he is calling out his church. The word for church is ecclesia. E-K-L-E-S-I-A. Ecclesia. Ek meaning coming out. So we're the called out ones. Remember it says that that when we've, we've preached on it in time past, where he says, come out from among them. And the same thing of delivering them from Egypt, Egypt representing the world, delivering them out of, and making them their own people. Throughout scripture, we keep seeing this calling out. Well, that's what we're involved with, you and I. We, in the kingdom of God, and the scheme of the kingdom of God, and all the things that are taking place in the mind, the heart, and the will of God, think of it, we're in the church age. You and I are in the age of the called out ones. You and I are in the age of God calling out of this mess that's all around us, whereas Murphy's Law reigns, right? If, if, it's, if it could go wrong, can go wrong, it will go wrong. In this age where everything seems to be a hassle, no matter how many plans are laid, no matter how much planning, no matter how many how many people you've talked to, no matter how many experts, why is it that something always doesn't flow the way you planned it? It's, it's just this world we live in. How can we set the sound system at 10 o'clock and by 10.30 something's wrong? It's right, <laughs> and nobody's touched it. There's this, the world we live in. So in this we recognize that God is calling out his church. And he says... Do not be conformed to this world. Did he not warn that? Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world. What's the warning to the church? Do not be conformed. Do not take its shape. Do not fashion yourself after it. Do not. The warning is there, is it not? It also says... It also says in Scripture, in uh, Luke chapter 9, I think it is. Luke chapter 9, verse 62, I think it is. When he says that a person who puts their hand to the plow, if they look back, they're not fit for the kingdom of God. I think that's a pretty powerful statement from the Lord, his, Lord's lips himself. That if you've put your hands to the plow, do not look back but continue onward and upward to the higher calling of Christ Jesus. Keep on moving on, onward and upward to the higher calling, and that's what Paul does as well. So when we're looking at this, we also recognize that the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, says that there are certain ones that will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is something to inherit. Galatians 5.21 says that there are works of the flesh that will not and cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now if you're taking notes, and it looks like many of you are, that 1 John 5.19, 1 John 5.19 says the whole world is under the sway of the enemy. And he calls them the devil. Devil meaning deceiver. Christ is the way, the truth, but the whole world is under the sway of the devil who is the deceiver. Directly opposing, perverting, and thwarting, attempting to thwart truth, which is Christ. That's why you have Christ and Antichrist. Against Christ. anti against Christ. Well, we're in the church age, praise be to God. They, the age where, remember, Jesus said that if they hated me, they're going to hate you. That's why many people, quote-unquote, backslide away from Christ 
because they don't want that scouring, scorning look that Christ gets. But if you're walking in the light as he is in the light, if you are walking as Christ, if you're uh, developing and maturing and that inner man is growing, the world will start giving you those looks, the same looks he got. Those looks that are seated in, rooted in, a hate towards him. That will happen because you have decided to be and live and exist in the Holy Spirit, which again is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It says, you know, you're not, they're not going to understand why you don't do the things that they do. Is that not so? They're not going to understand why you don't do the things that they do. Why aren't you laughing at that? That's really funny. No, it's not. Why aren't you watching? Why aren't you excited about this? Why aren't you? How come you can't? How come you're not? And the finger pointing begins. Why? How come you can't? Boy, you're... When in actuality, it is basically, the, at core, Christ in you. And as you grow and mature, that will happen. It will happen with your family. It will happen with your friends. It will happen. No matter where you are, it will happen. So you must recognize it. It doesn't matter whether you're 2 years old or 20 years old or 200 years old. It doesn't matter. It's going to happen. That's why people like, oftentimes like, their Christianity private the private Christian. Because then they can come to church on Sundays, praise the Lord, worship the Lord, go out, and then basically kind of just fit in. Which is conforming yourself to the world. But I don't want to know that scripture. I want just Jesus bless me scripture. <laughs> right? <laughs> just that one. So, but that's what happens. So, in this great plan that God is doing, we're in the church age. God is bringing forth the church. He's drawing people out, and he has revealed the church basically at core three ways. Number one, this one I think is just beautiful. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. When you're thinking the church age, and he's, and he's illustrating what's taking place in the heavens. What's taking place in this invisible realm? What's going on in our lives? How do I fit in this church? What is God doing? He has revealed it in a way that we would understand by basically using our own body. So that every time we are awake, we can look at our own body or anyone around us and see the body of Christ at work. It's sovereign work that it does. The way that it moves, the way that it thinks, the way that it acts, the way that it responds, the way that one hand helps another, the way that the feet respond to what the mind is looking to do. And just like if you remember that little illustration I used in regards to uh, raking the leaves and going to get the leaves, and that whole idea of, of that's, you know, go, go get the leaves. Well, I'm not the one who saw it. You saw it. You go get it. And uh, why do I, you know, right foot, take a step. Why do I have to go first? How come the left foot can't go first? And, you know, that, that doesn't, that's not how the body works. You never get anything done. Right? There has to be constant mutual respect for the members of the body. And so in this, we recognize that God has revealed itself as in the body of Christ. Not just the body, but the body of Christ. He came in a body of flesh, walked among us, which we have termed theologically as the incarnation, meaning God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. He died on the cross. This, this body, this tabernacle, this tent was put off. And he arose again with a glorified body of which we do not yet know what that is like. No one has seen it. No one understands it. So in this, we are now in the same area. We are denying the passions and desires and appetites of this body. And there are many. And we are living in and existing in the spiritual body, which is Christ. Does that make sense? So you are constantly, every day, in that battle of denying the powers and pleasures and appetites and the sensual and sensory aspects of your five senses that are demanding and commanding of you to appease it and have to deny and instead desire the things of God which is of the spiritual body. Meaning I'm denying the things of this world and the appetites of this world that satisfy the senses of this body, 
the sin that runs through it, seeking to fulfill its desires, and satisfy instead the spiritual body of Jesus Christ. Hence the battle every day. Does that make sense? So, in this, looking at a few scriptures, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. In the midst of dealing with the various gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we'll be talking about, in our future classes, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, in talking about the various gifts of the Spirit in our lives, says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. So everyone has a part to play in the body of Christ who has Christ. Anyone who has the Spirit of Christ, anyone who has the Holy Spirit, you have a part to play in the body of Christ. Unfortunately, outward churches have designed this oftentimes to quote-unquote a labeled ministry in the church. But that's not the case. The body of Christ goes much beyond that. The one who has that ability to encourage another doesn't need a label of ministry. That, that's our encourager section. They sit over there. You know? That's, yeah, that's, you know, that's, the, that's this section. That's, and they're sort of all, if you need this, that's where you go over here. And, you know, we, we're going to have a, a, a personal prophecy booths out in the foyer. You know? <laughs> That if you need a word from the Lord, you go to the booths and you sit there and you get your... And, and unfortunately, some churches are doing that. You know, that, which is sad. Because, but that's what they've reduced the body down to. But that's not what it's talking about. Just think of your own body and how it works. That as a, and you've heard me use this illustration before, but I think it's a sound one. That when the left hand hurts for whatever reason. Uh, I was just uh, plucking some thorns and little... Uh, pickers, uh, it didn't matter what gloves I used, those things got through. And I'm using welding gloves, and it didn't matter, those things find their way in. And one got right in my thumb, which I'll tell you, that got a lot of attention. <laughs> that with tweezers and everything and trying to, and even now it's all calloused up, and it's trying to get that thing I can't see out. I just want it, what, out of my body. And the whole body knows it's there. And it's calling upon the right hand to help. Funny how it didn't call on the right foot. Why didn't you call me? I could have done something about it, right? <laughs> but, but that's not how the body works. Just think of your own body. When you need hearing, you use your ears. When you need speaking, you use. When you need sight, you use. When you need smell, you do. When you need walking, when you need planning, there's, when you need building, when you need encouragement, what, Think of your own body. That's the body of Christ. And it's not in the natural, it's in the spiritual. That's the key to understand. So when we're looking at this aspect, we start seeing that we all are, and it says, members individually. So you are all part of the body of Christ. In the corporate body of Christ, the Lord is one, the Bible says. There's one body. How many bodies? One. One body. If there's one body, there's... One head. And the head is Christ. The mind of Christ. Christ is the head. We're the body of Christ. All things come from the head to the body. We may send our pains up to the mind, but the mind will respond what to do. Right? Again, cut your finger. It's ah, ah, ah. Right? You heard it, whatever, it's going to take attention. But the impulses are always going to, we might as well call that prayer. That you're responding continually. The body is responding to the mind continually. It's not separating itself saying, oh, I don't want to pray today. As a matter of fact, it says pray unceasingly. Just as your body is constantly in communication with the mind. Almost to the point that 
Uh, that you don't think about uh, left foot or right foot. Not sure. Left? No. Right? No. You're, you're not doing that. Right? You're, you're so hesitant and paralyzed with, you just go. The body of Christ moves forward, and the more mature we get, the more all of a sudden you're stumbling less, and you're moving forward, and you're operating in the corporate body of one, but in that body you have an individual place that you alone fit. That's what's important to remember here. Now, as we're moving forward, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. And it says, and this is a great letter. It says, and he put all things under his feet. How many things? And gave him, meaning Christ, to be head over all things to the church. Gave him to be head to the church, which is his body. It says in verse 23, his body. So here we understand that Christ is the head, the church is the body, and in his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. A lot more could be said here, that's for sure. But think of it now, that Christ is the head, that the church, and it specifically says the church, the called out ones. You and I are in the church age. Now think about this body that we're talking about. The 3,000 that were added at the day of Pentecost when the church was brought forth and empowered, those first 3,000 are in the church age. And you and I are too. We, they've gone on before us, but you and I are currently in the process where we are being knitted together with them. That's why what they said and what they did has meaning. And even the prayers and the teachings that they've done, we record them and still use them today and they still minister to us. We are all part of this great body. Think of the tremendous revivals that have gone on where thousands or even millions have given their lives to the Lord. Just look at what's taken place in the African continent. Look what's taken place today in the South American continent where tremendous revival is breaking out and people are coming to the Lord and what? They're being added to the body of Christ daily. And even here in our own little circle called Epsom, we are in Epsom and in Chichester and in Manchester and Hooksit and Pembroke and Allentown and Northwood and in Pittsfield and Barnston and Alton and we're drawing what? And adding to the church daily so that this body is just coming to the point where when it's mature or when it's ready to be brought forth, it will be made known as it really is, just as a woman in labor. When the baby is ready, when the body is ready, there it is. So, in this, we are seeing and witnessing the body of Christ that we are part of continually growing as well. And the head is Christ Jesus. He's the head. He gave him to be head over all things, and the church is his body and the fullness of him that fills in all. Now, in this, let's look at 1 Corinthians. Go back just to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 48 and 49. 1 Corinthians 15, 48 and 49. This is a great section of scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 48 and 49 which, you, I don't know if you remember, I did that section of uh, sermons, a five-sermon series on the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 is known as the resurrection chapter. It deals much with the resurrection, and I did a five-part series on the resurrection. Resurrection rulership, resurrection righteousness, resurrection revealed, and a few others. This one here, in this same chapter, there's this beautiful uh, understanding of what's taken place in this body. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 48 and 49 says this, As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Do you catch what it's saying there? Is that there's two men that have been brought forth. One created from dust, Adam. Or as the Bible calls in other places, the first Adam. The one who was created first. 
the first Adam, a man of dust. That's what it says here. The man of dust. He was earth made, made of earth. What gave that body that was made valuable? What made it valuable? What made that body? Life was breathed into him. What makes this body valuable is not the what you wear, put on it, not the makeup, not the hairdo, not the... What makes it valuable is the soul, the life that's in it. When that breath is gone, the body loses all value. And it's not long before it shows what it is. Right? Dust to dust. Ashes to ashes. It's gone. And so in this, we recognize that as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. Now, who is that? So also are those who are made of dust. Everyone, right? Everyone. Every human being you've ever come across, no matter how great or no matter how lowly, no matter how rich or how poor, no matter how ill or how healthy, every one of them actually is a man of dust, made in the image of the first Adam. So, also it says, as was the man of dust, so also are those are made of dust, verse 48. And is the heavenly man, this is the second Adam, not created, but begotten, brought forth, God himself. The second man is the Lord from heaven, it says in verse 47. So also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, all of us, we have that same look as with Adam. That's, this goes directly against any evolutionary principle. This directly opposes anything to do with evolutionary principle. Even the so-called theistic evolution does away with that. The whole idea that evolution was under God's care and brought forth. and that, This does away with that. This directly opposes any of that. And so also are those who are heavenly, verse 49, and as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also, notice the future aspect, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Meaning, right now, think of what's going on. Right now, you and I, we look at each other, and what are we seeing with our eyes? But the, what Adam are you seeing? The man of dust. The image, the likeness of the man of dust. You shall bring them forth after your own kind. Right? That's what the Bible says. So we're seeing among us, but what's going on inside? The inner man, the heavenly man, the new man, the spiritual man, is currently in the process, and I, the Holy Spirit is being very patient with us in trying to mature us, is he not? <laughs> and thank God, right? <laughs> and when we mess up, he says, forgiveness and mercy is waiting for you. All you have to do is just turn and confess your sins. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, that's what it says. If you confess your sins, he is just faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. We can just walk in him and he strengthens us and, and, uh, and causes us to mature because that's what the Holy Spirit's doing in our lives. Bringing forth his character, his conduct, and putting his concerns in our lives. So all of a sudden, it's not getting and gaining, but instead, it's moving onward and upward. That's what he's doing in our lives. So in this, we look at each other and we see the man of dust. Look throughout all the world and you see the man of dust. And the church actually, therefore, is invisible. Not actual visible to us. Because we do not yet know what we will be. It says even here, we shall take on the likeness. But it says in 1 John, I think it's chapter 3, that we do not yet know what we will be. But the time is coming when he is revealed, we will be revealed because we'll be just like him. But the revelation of Christ will also be the revelation of the saints, meaning, what are we? But the body, the true body of Christ will finally one day be known. That's going to be a sight, is it not? I mean, that's going to be a sight. Uh, I was just thinking of it today, thinking of all the... The stars and the body, it says, going through this chapter, and it talks about the, the body of this and the body of that. And you see all the various animal life and insect life and bug life and beast life and bird life. And you see, and you see the, the human man, the man of dust. But the one thing we have not yet seen or experienced, we have just a touch of it, is the heavenly man. What that is going to be. That's something. And that heavenly man is in anyone who has Christ. And they're in the body of Christ 
individually set in the corporate oneness of God. Just tremendous when you dwell on that and think on that. And lastly, in the book of Ephesians, and I want to send you back there, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Make sure you write this down. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Now, keep in mind, even though that we're dealing with a shall be, it also is, currently is. Please catch that. That even though right now, the body, the heavenly body, will one day shall be, we are currently dealing with also currently is. Because look at what it says here in chapter 2, verse 6, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That right now, God looks at you as already seated with him. It says in, in the Bible, uh, I think it's Romans and also in Philippians, that you are citizens of heaven. You are no longer strangers to him. You are citizens of heaven. You are, as Abraham was, a pilgrim in this world, a soldier. That you are walking through this world, but you're not, what the Bible say, of this world, as we have addressed earlier. So in this, when we look at it and say, and he raised us up together, and made us sit together. Now, if we can't sit together among ourselves where well, we can see each other, what makes us think we're going to be able to sit together when we get up there? Right? There, a harmony and a unity of the brethren is absolutely essential. That's why the unity of the brethren is constantly stressed because what? The body is one. So when we're dealing with the unity of the brethren is a wonderful thing. The reason it is, is because it's corporately one. We're one body, the body working in unity. So in this, he has brought, raised us up together with to sit together in heavenly places with who? In Christ Jesus. So that's the body of Christ. When you think of it, when you look at yourself, when you think of what God is doing, righteousness, peace, and joy is in me. Moving forward, seated together with him in heavenly places. Remember, he met you where you are, and he's taking you where he is. He treats you not as to what you were. He treats you as to what you are. You're a citizen of heaven. And he treats you accordingly. And he calls for you to obey, uh, to obey the laws of the kingdom. Now. And the laws of the kingdom are righteousness, peace, joy, love, faith, grace, mercy, Obey these things. All the law is fulfilled in one word, which is love. Love. So in this, we obey those because those are the laws of the kingdom. He treats us as to not what we were, thank God, but he treats us, all of us, as to what we currently are. He, he doesn't, Con now, and this may hurt some people, but he doesn't console the old man. Remember, we've talked about that. He's not out to console and comfort that old man. He has one answer for your, your old man feelings and your old man emotions. Well, pastor, how can you be so harsh? Don't you see I'm hurting here? You're in the flesh. He wants you in faith. But that seems awfully rude. No, he rise up, become. He wants us to be treated. He wants to treat us as. Does that mean he is emotionalist? No. Remember, Jesus wept. But he speaks to the situations to raise us up that we live by faith, not by sight. Okay? So in this, let's go to number two. This next great illustration that was presented by the Lord and in Scripture. We have the body of Christ. This kingdom, we're in the church age. The church has also been revealed as, and you're all aware of this one, the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. So you're the body, sovereignly one. You're also the bride of Christ. You're part of that, the body. The body is the bride of Christ. And if you're talking bride, you're automatically talking married. And if you're married, you're dealing with covenant, vows, oaths. And if you're dealing with marriage, what's it say in Scripture about two men and a man and a woman coming together will be as one? Again, the oneness, the unity, the covenant relationship. If I am married, 
which I am, married to Kara, and I go off because I've turned aside to another? What is that called? Adultery. You've turned aside. You've put your eyes on another. Matter of fact, it used to be the actual act. Jesus made it clear. Just even the look, the thought is, you're, that's an adulterous presence. Why does he take it so serious? Because a covenant of oneness has taken place. Again, that oneness, that whole idea of unity, of coming together in a covenant relationship with God. The bride of Christ is therefore currently in covenant with God Almighty, Christ Almighty, right? We have been promised to him. We have been betrothed to him. And therefore, as in covenant with him, promised to him, he therefore is looking for us to be loyal to him as he is also the loyal bridegroom. Think of Joseph and Mary. Now I know that uh, a variety of doctrines have come forth to kind of really mess that up. But think of Joseph and Mary. Mary betrothed to Joseph and when she was found with child, what was the first thought? Right? Because, because evidently something's taken place and it wasn't Joseph. Even though they had not yet come together, she was already promised to. And so in this, you and I have been promised to, and we are currently in the process of even going forward, and one day we'll fully consummate that relationship. But remember also it talks about the five, the ten virgins that go, they're one, some are ready and some are not. Big message there too. So we have to, he's coming back for a bride that is pure and spotless, meaning that you have not turned aside. Remember, consider what great things God has done for you. That little message that we did, when it says in 1 Samuel chapter 12, I think it is, when he says, do not turn aside. What was he talking about? Don't turn aside to the other nations. Don't turn aside to those other gods. In other words, don't play the adulterer. Stay loyal to God Almighty. I used to tell my boys all throughout their, as, as young as they could start understanding or in, in, t uh, starting to think about the things of gals and, and uh, all this, this whole being plagued with all this dating thing and relationship thing and valuing yourself in regards to how many girls like you or who likes you and all that stuff you had to deal with as parents. And uh, thank God that's behind me. And, and uh, so in all of that, it came down to, and I would tell them regularly that, uh, son, when you come across that gal that is for you. Do you want to know that she's been loyal? Do you want her loyal to you and that she has been loyal to you? That even though you didn't know her, he said, yeah. I said, then do the same for her. Start now with your loyalty. Don't wait for it to kick in, but start now. Because that is the godly message of the Holy Spirit, what is he doing? What's his concern? That we would start now. But I know but yesterday and last week and I just understood. But start now. Start now walking down the road of that I am betrothed to another. Therefore, we reject all others. I have one. I have one. Picked one. Therefore, in my picking, in my choosing, in my covenant relationship with Kara, Therefore, I have automatically set myself against all others. Not that I'm a their foe, but I'm just not going to have that kind of relationship with them because I've already established that covenant with another. Just take this all and make it spiritual in the things of God with us as the bride of Christ because it works out that way. That's why our American marriage system, our entire American marriage system process is built on and is an illustration of the heavenly. We didn't, we didn't take, the scripture wasn't taken off of the marriages, marriage way of doing, uh, 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 the system of doing marriages. Rather, our American system of the dressed in white, with the veil, being pure, coming, betrothed, best man, all of this has been taken out of Scripture 
And we have an American system of marriage that currently today is being all perverted and ignored because it no longer has that Christian value. But in this, we need to recognize that that doesn't mean that it changes what Scripture's saying to the body of Christ, meaning, or to the bride of Christ, that we are betrothed to another. Look at now, and you're familiar with these couple of these scriptures, but first of all, let's look at Revelation 22, 17. One you've heard me preach on and speak on and reference on a regular basis. Revelation 22, 17. And there's a variety of scriptures that talk about the bride of Christ, but we just want to focus on a few of them before we move to our number three. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, Come. And whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The Spirit and the Bride have the great invitation out there. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Look at Revelation 21. Just go back. Revelation 21 verse 2 and verse 9. Revelation 21, verse 2, and then verse 9. Let's look at this. Look, it says, Then I, John, the Apostle John, saw the holy city. Let me tell you, there's a huge message in this, but we don't have time tonight, but think of this. Then I, John, saw the holy city. What's it called? Yeah, and what's it called? What's the name of the city here? New Jerusalem. Not old Jerusalem, but the Jerusalem that is currently in the natural reflects God's eye is on, not on that city as much as he is on New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. The very scriptures that were promised back in the days of the, of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, is today here fulfilled. That's an amazing thing. God with men. That's been his intent all along, and even the tabernacle is, the, is representation of the presence of God on earth. Signifying and illustrating that God's intent has been and, and, and will continue to be God with men, men with God. They will be my people. I will be their God. But keep in mind, this isn't just everybody and anybody. This, these are the saints or the separated ones. The ones who have been separated from the world. This, remember, because it says in Galatians chapter 5 that in a variety of other places, adulterers and murderers and liars and all this are not part of the kingdom of God. That there is, I wrote an article one time in a paper, somebody was writing an article about this whole tolerance issue, which fed me right up to about here, so I sent off a letter. And it, but heaven, if you're talking about tolerance and intolerance, heaven will be a very intolerant place. If you want to look at it with that kind of mentality, we just read, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. Everyone is welcome, but he will meet you where you are. He will not only take you where he is, but he will make you like him. His character, his conduct, his concerns, his personhood, his presence, his power in us. But anything that is of the flesh, of wickedness, of not of his character, is outside the gates, is not part of him. So we always are looking at how are we aligning ourselves. Well, as the body of Christ, as I gave you that illustration earlier, that little thorn, that little thicket that I couldn't even see was not part of my body. Right? And all of a sudden, my entire focus, now it's not like I stayed home all day long and said, oh, yeah, I get it. Right? But all day long, I knew it was there. Your, your body was aware that every time you, I'm try, I tried to take a bolt out of my son's car and it's like, oh man, I have to use my other hand and you just have to hit it, just touch it. Because what? Because it's not part of the body. And get it out. Out. And when it was gone, when it's finally gone, phew, I'm glad that's gone. Not part of the body. Warts, not part of the body. Viruses, bacteria, what? The whole body is working against it. You're not part of. Sovereignly acts. You don't even have to ask it to. It starts fighting against it. 
immediately starts in trying to encase the problem, get rid of the problem. It sovereignly acts, lesson to be learned there. So in this, we also have, as the bride of Christ, we have, we have the body sovereignly working, we have the bride of Christ called to be loyal, called to be true, called to be in covenant. And think of it this way, think of it this way, that and as the bride of Christ, and now we're all mature adults here, but think of it this way, when a, when a woman and a man for the first time ever come together, a piece of flesh is broken and blood comes forth. A covenant is cut. Blood comes forth. Blood is broken. Blood is, is shed, meaning the covenant has been cut. And that's the way it has been, that the two become as one. That's the enormous significance. I don't know how evolution figured out how to put that in there. But that in itself should tell everyone that there's something going on and God takes it serious and he put it inside. Every, every woman is born with this system, this, this little piece of flesh that is cut, broken, and the, and the covenant takes place and it's always done in blood. Blood is shed. Covenants of God are always in blood because the life of the flesh is in the blood. God shed his blood for us, sent forth the spirit. The spirit is life. Think of the tremendous messages and all of that that God is sending forth to us to understand what he has done in our lives. So we are the body of Christ and Revelation chapter 19, Going, I know we're going the wrong way in Revelation, but Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 9, what's he telling us? Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. What has she done? She has made herself ready. The marriage supper of the Lamb. It says in verse 9, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, I don't know about you, but when you're thinking about a marriage supper that's put on and hosted by God himself, that should be a time. God is going to have, shall be, is coming, a marriage supper that the bride will be brought forth and the consummated with the husband and, we are, and many are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Keep in mind, we're in the church age. Not all saints throughout the beginning of time and the end of time belong to the church. There are saints and then there's the church. And the church age are those who belong to the bride of Christ. But it says in Hebrews that, that, there's, that there's other saints. Those of the Old Testament saints. Those who, but they have not yet been perfected and we will have not yet been fully perfected because they, he's, not, he's going to do it all at one time. Does that make sense? So, the great mysteries of God. That, you know, we see pieces and understand pieces, but not fully seen or known as it really is just yet. So, in this, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So, number three. We have the, number one, the body of Christ, the church. Number two. We have the bride of Christ. Number three, the building of God. The building. God is the master architect. The master builder. He's constructing a temple. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16. The building of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, and we'll go into verse 17. <clears throat> Asking basically a rhetorical question. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 
if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. Now that should put the fear right in us. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now that's not a question at the end. He's stating it. Which temple you are. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have the Spirit. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know this? Therefore, kind of encouraging them with, the, with understanding that basically, since you are, since you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, then, since you are, do you not know, stay holy. Stay focused on, keep receiving the things of God. The temple of God. Look at verse 13 real quick. Tremendous message here, but we won't go into it too much, but just look at that. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Verse 14, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Reward is direct. There are rewards. I've stressed it over and over again. There are rewards. There's nothing wrong with seeking reward. But just look for the rewards that are promised rather than the pleasures that currently are. That's the key. Now, if you can flip to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, go towards the end of your Bible. 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. Coming to him as to a living stone. Rejected indeed by men, we just talked about that earlier, but chosen by God and precious. And also as living stones, meaning us, are being built up a spiritual house. That house is called the holy priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. In this, we need to recognize that God is building, and there's a chief cornerstone. The temple that is being built, the holy habitation, Christ is the chief cornerstone, rejected by the disobedient. Rejected by the disobedient. But to you and I, he is precious. But to those who are perishing, they reject him. To them, he has become a stone of offense, a stumbling block. A rock of offense, a stone of stumbling. Rejected, but to you and I, he's precious, is what it says here. Verse 4, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You and I are living stones. Remember what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that offer living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. Here you are, living stones, being brought together, whereas Christ is the chief cornerstone, meaning in setting these buildings, they would set one large stone of which everything else was fitted to. It directed the chief cornerstone out of the four corners. The chief cornerstone is the one they built off of the whole building to make it true. That one directed everything else. It was built from that. That became the standard of which everything else was built from. For all the corners and how high the walls would be and everything about it. So in this, we recognize that the body of Christ is being built up, but also we need to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. says this, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. What's the foundation? The apostles and prophets. Chief cornerstone, Christ himself, in whom the whole building, you and I, the living stones, are being what? Joined together. Think of it also as the body. Joined together, knitted together, infinitely and wonderfully and intimately made, knitted together, being brought together, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God, where? In the Spirit. So you and I are being knitted together, brought together for the temple of God. God Almighty will, the Spirit of God will reside in. Remember that whole tabernacle of God is with men. The apostles and the prophets, foundations, foundational stones, chief cornerstone. That means all the things that the prophets have said, all the things the apostles have said and done. All this, the foundation that we are being built on as living stones, being joined together, being built up. The Holy Spirit is in us. Do you not know the Holy Spirit of God is in you? Do you not know you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? Being joined together, brought up, knitted together, joined together, where we are the holy habitation of God, or as also says, a holy priesthood. Marvelous. Marvelous. Well worth spending time in discerning and in, in, in knowing what the scriptures are revealing to us here. Uh, just a couple more that we need to look at, at is 2 Peter one, chapter 1, verse 14. 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 14. I know we were just in the Peter letters, but to keep a flow of thought going, it's better this way. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, which says this. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Note Peter writing now to the church, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, or tabernacle. I must put off my tent, tabernacle, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. What's he ta talking about there? What's going to happen? He's going to die. He's going to die in the way that Christ told him he would die. He's about to die, and he says, what? I'm coming to that time where I must put off this tent. I must put off this tabernacle. This temporary presence. There's currently in the heavens a temple that's being erected and living stones are being joined together for it. Making sense? The Holy Spirit is currently in us preparing us for that temple as living stones. You are currently in the process of being prepared for that place and that place is being prepared for you. But right now, you and I, the Holy Spirit in us, we are in this tent, this tabernacle. Just as the tabernacle was brought about, God was with men, so you are your own mini tabernacle, your mini tent. Peter says, I'm going to about put this off. He was prepared and it's come his time where he's going to be fit and joined together in that temple. So when Paul writes to them in Corinthians and says, do you not know you're the temple of the Holy Ghost? Remember, he's just as scripture has done in other places, treating you just as where you are. That's also in the place when Solomon was building his temple. This is now, and I preached a message on this, by the way, it's on Kingdom Quest International, prepared for his presence, if you want to look at it, prepared for his presence. In that, when Solomon was building his temple for the habitation of God, illustrating the permanent presence of where we're going. Just as there's New Jerusalem, there's a new temple. When he told Moses what to build, he says, just as the pattern that I showed you. In this, every stone that was prepared for Solomon's temple was not a hammer or a chisel heard at the temple site. Every stone was prepared away in the quarry. Then when it was finally prepared and ready, then it was brought and placed exactly in its place that it needed to be. This is the same thing that's going on with you and I today. Let God take his hands to who you are and prepare you 
for where He's bringing you. And when He's ready for that living stone, it's time for you. And you're brought and placed. Here, sadness. There, great joy. Because you have just found your place of permanence in the body of Christ. You are currently in the preparation stage for where God is bringing you. He is preparing you for that place and He's preparing that place for you. The time has not yet come for all of us to be. The revelation, just as the body of Christ, just as the bride of Christ, speaking for loyalty and purity, speaking of covenant, so is the building currently prepared. And everyone who, is here, who understands building understands there's a process to it, would understand the, how you lay things out and you have dimensions and everything is built and must be built with trueness. Level and true. Causing things to be plumb. Or else if you just keep using your own eye, it won't be long before you're off. And one person's eye, like if, now Fab, you're a builder, Todd, you're a builder. Go there, give instruction to the people who's going to be building, and say, that's okay, use your own eye. And you'll end up soon on the job site with judges, everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. And it won't be long before it looks that way. Instead, you give them the plan, you give them the tape, you give them the level, you give them the plumb line, and you say, use these. <laughs> right? In the same way, God has given us tools to use to prepare us for that place. He says, iron sharpens iron. He is currently in the process throughout all the world and throughout time preparing us His way, His tools through encouragement, through comfort, through patience, through adversity, through tribulation, through all kinds of difficulties that come your way for this one great thing, to prepare you for that place. Let his hands get a hold of you. It's called the master's hands. Let the potter wheel spin. Let him make you, form you, fashion you, fit for the master's use. That will be a wonderful thing when he takes you and puts you in that home, in that place, for such a time as, as the kingdom of God being fully revealed. That, saints of God, is what's taken place. A good foundation has been laid. A chief cornerstone is in place. And as living stones being placed in those things. All of this, so much more to look at. All having to deal with the kingdom of God. Lastly, let's take five minutes to let me finish up as to what's taken place with the kingdom. Lastly, let's look at this. No scriptures, I'll just I'll give them to you, won't look for the sake of time. What is God concerned with? Just so we can finish tonight. What is God concerned with? The, he's concerned with the kingdom of God. Let's look at that next one, number nine. Number nine is, what is he concerned with? He's concerned with the inner man, concerned with the perfect man, concerned with, concerned with the kingdom of God. What is he concerned with? What's his focus? He's concerned with completing his plan. His plan. Whose plan? His plan. Our plan? His plan. He's concerned with completing his plan. He's got his own timetable. He's got his own calendar. He knows what he's doing. He's taking place. All we need to do is just trust in him. Number 10 and last one. What is he concerned with? He's concerned with fulfilling his promises. He's fulfilling his word. How many times did Jesus say to fulfill the scriptures? to fulfill the scriptures, so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. God is fulfilling his promises. He's not a man that he should lie. He's not a liar. He, what he says will take place, and he has he's set it out, and he has established, he has created time so that all these things would take place, and he has declared what he will do. He has created a tremendous adversary to come against him. He has revealed what he will do, and even in the midst of revealing it and using the weakest of vessels, he is destroying the mighty creation of, a, of, a, of evil that comes against him in an, ad, uh, an adversary. Thus revealing that he is sovereign power and ruler over all, and only his righteousness stands. In this, he has declared that he is faithful and true. What are you just saying that? I have proven it. 
I am the one who's righteous. No one else is righteous. No one does good. There's the proof. And in the midst of it all, a sovereign, almighty power, he has revealed what he will do. He has had a mighty adversary, the, 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 the perfect wickedness, coming against him as the great adversary or Satan, the great deceiver against his truth or devil, the great red dragon sweeping all finds of fire, trying to devour who he, who he is and what he does, even displaying his, from the beginning to the end, has said all the things he will do, and even in this, using the weakest of vessels of clay, has defeated the mighty powers, the principalities and powers of the air. How has he done that? Because men and women saw fit to humble themselves and pray and seek the Lord's face and say, I will believe God. How do they do that? By the Spirit of God who's in them, who inspires them and says, I have denied this world. God is not of this world. I am of God. I'm not of this world. I'm of Him. And in that have moved heaven and earth. And in all of this, every day, shame in the enemy by saying, I am not going to be a part of this. That's what you and I are involved with. It goes beyond just, just, just say, oh, gee, I've got to read my Bible. Gotta... Every time you do, you shame that enemy. And every time you do, you build yourself up, prepared one more day for the presence of God, the fullness of God coming. That's what he's done. Because he said on the cross, it is finished. And at the end of Revelation, what's he say? It is done. On the cross, he paid the price. It's finished. But when it all is culminated and all done and everything's done, and he's about to usher in New Jerusalem, us, New heavens, new earth. What's he say? It is done. We have been prepared for the ages to come. What's he concerned with? That's what he's concerned with. Focus on those and you will do well. Focus on those and the peace, the joy, and the righteousness and the Holy Spirit will be yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand before the King? Hallelujah, Jesus. My prayer is that all of this, all that has been said and done, would sink in. As you, as you ate tonight the Word of God, having it in your mouth, tearing it up, bringing it down, swallow it. Swallow it. Because that's where it is digested. That's where the body receives its nourishment when you digest it. Don't spit it out. Gnaw on it. Chew on it. Swallow it. And digest it. In this, God will continue to mold you, make you, fashion you to become all that he sees that you can be and will be. His sovereign hand is upon you. He is with you and he'll never leave you, never forsake you. You have life. Let this life come forth in abundance. Don't stay small, but grow up and become all that he would have you to be. Encourage others to mature in the things of God. Recognize I'm in the body of Christ. I'm the bride of Christ. I'm the building of God. His habitation. He's my husband. I'm New Jerusalem. The spirit and the bride say come. I'm the body of Christ. I have a place. And in this you will realize and come to realize that in this there's great purpose. That it's not so much what you do on this earth. It's what he's doing in you. Let Jesus, let the hand of Jesus have his way in your life. You are the clay. He is the potter. He's the master. He's the teacher. He's the father. Submit fully and wholly as a good member of the body of Christ. And you will find the purpose, the passion you've always been looking for. Lord, let your blessing be upon each and every one of them. In Jesus' name. And the body of Christ said, Amen. 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 Walk with God. Love him and let him love you in Jesus' name.